Hello. Hello. Yes, good, good, good. How are you? I'm good. I'm sorry. I was. Uh, I ran a little bit late, but I yeah. hope it's not. It's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're here now. Elaine, thank you very much for being on the Think Big for Africa podcast. Uh, let's start this way. Tell my audience who you are and what you do. All right. So a little bit about myself. So hi, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Eileen from the African Youth Diaspora Organization in the state of African Diaspora, as well as the AFCFT Youth Advisory Council. I know that's a, a mouthful of um, titles, but that's pretty much give you a big picture of what I do in Africa. I am an ecosystem builder. I like to think of myself actually as a communicate, uh, community advocate and really into youth uh, empowerment and community economic development uh, in the gist of it. But I also kind of think of my, myself as like a system builders. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more later, like in my later questions. Okay. So, hi Okay. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, you are an American of Chinese heritage. Okay. Yes. Now, yet you are very involved in issues concerning and in organizations dealing with African issues. Now, the first time I, I met you on LinkedIn talking about Africa, I was curious, okay? And since we agreed to have this discussion and see your bio, I was even more curious. So tell me, what attracted you to get involved in African issues? Mm -hmm. Frankly speaking, I didn't really come into this space until three to four years ago. Okay. I mean, four, four or five years ago, I should say. And I was very ignorant about what uh, has been happening in Africa. And I was pretty much, you know, like most of the world, uh, you know, the way that we understand Africa is through media. And unfortunately, the media has not been kind to Africa, to the continents and the people. So very simply put, um, I just want to see justice served, you know, okay. uh, for Africa, Africans and African diaspora. Um, personally, I feel that we are our brothers and sisters keeper. Okay. So I expect you to do the same for me if you see I suffer from injustice. Um, otherwise, it has been a natural resonance. Um, it feels like my whole life experience has been for this purpose mm. being here being with the people i'm with but it, it couldn't have happened earlier if it happened any earlier uh it wouldn't be the right place the right time or, or the right people yeah so okay. it, it's just this divine intervention i'm not sure if that kind of help but if you really want to know why it's really about seeing justice served and of course when you see justice served it, it just put everything back to its natural balance and natural okay. order i think that's important yeah okay now when you say seeing justice served what do, what does that mean justice about what in particular and you know yeah Let um, okay, so very few people understand the history, or I should say very few people outside of Africa. Okay. Understand the history of um, the, the modern African history, and that is including the African diaspora. Very few very African diaspora actually know. Uh, I mean, of course, it's getting better now, but um, the African diaspora do not really know African history, and Africans do not really know Africa. The, uh, the struggles that African diaspora um, went through. So, and then compounded with that, you have foreign actors, you no, know, uh, imposing their own agenda okay. onto, onto Africa and Africans. And so it makes things very complex and you it makes it very biased and skewed. For example, mm. the way we see Africa in the US, uh, is 
you know, recently it's getting better, but before this, it was really about um, poverty, Boko Haram, violence, pir pirates, you know, from Somalia, and, you know, Boko Haram from Nigeria, and just very unsafe. And of course, children with big belly, you know, wrong eyes with flies in the eyes and really starving, you know, yeah. things like that. And so that's that's all we know, like okay. outside of Africa. And I just, but once I knew about Africa, then that was when I realized I was blown away by how skewed the media has been portraying Africa. It was so unfair. It's just so. And then when I first came in, I was I came into the space as the director of Model United Nation uh, in Johannesburg. I was the director of outreach and I was responsible for recruiting many, many uh, African youth ambassadors for the event. And through that process, I get to know Africa really well. For example, um, my Zimbabwean ambassadors would tell me that their full time in Zimbabwe would be working 46 hours a week and making $50 a month. And, and then somebody tell me that, oh, well, Actually, in the rural area, you make thirty-five dollars, and that's you know for you know four years ago. And then somebody, my another friend from Uganda, told me that um, so they are they are making a hundred dollars a month, and then the highest I heard is in Tanzania, which is making two hundred dollars a month as a teacher. Now, in the U.S., uh, teachers is considered low low paying job. You know, we don't. Unfortunately, you know, unlike Asia, the U.S. doesn't really like respect, you know, the teaching profession as much. Mm -hmm. And so that we're pay getting paid like starting salary, like $2,500 and things like that. So, but it's still a ratio of 50 times. So then now, regardless what happened, um, like, you know, because there's always the excuses why a country is making less than a and more developed country, you know, so on and so forth. But it's not even relevant anymore because when you, how, how do you even justify a country making $50 a month? I mean, it doesn't, it's totally not just, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. It make, does not make logical sense. So then when I, 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 I get to know the ambassadors really well and when I dug deeper, it was just astounding the history that I, the suffering, the injustice, the, the unfairness and the fact that Zimbabwe is still in sanction. And then when you first was put in sanction was because of Mugabe's policy and then he's long gone. I don't understand why, I mean, I still would, I talk, I know some of the people who's, who knows the insider, information really well and they will say well because you know they are uh, they have human right issue violation issues and corruption and blah blah and I was like why don't you try to live on $50 a month and see if you will be corrupted you know there's just a lot of injustice that does not take somebody who understands history to understand something is really wrong so that yeah. was kind of where my the beginning of my journey and then of course, myself, I was, I, I'm a, I, was, I grew up as a colonial subject. I was, uh, I grew up in the British colony. And I remember growing up putting whites on the pedestal. And it really affected me for a long time. Um, so when I ran into one of the Nigerian ambassador, youth ambassador, he told me one time, he's like, you know, Dr. Eileen, when I see you, I want to touch you. And I was like, why would you want to touch me? And he's like, because you're white and so your skin is cooler and softer. And I was like, that's really, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's messed up. And he reminded me of myself when I was younger, because I remember going to restaurants and then there'll be a bunch of people standing in line and come to go, like come to white people and they will come to the you know, and then they will get seated first. It doesn't matter how long everybody else has waited. You know, if you're white, you get seated first. I wait, I'm talking about Caucasian, right? Mm. And I was, I still remember that. I remember not being, saying that being punished for speaking, you know, the native language, right? And I, I remember, I remember being taught 
Western history and not knowing how, because, you know, I, it was like, I was born in Hong Kong and Hong Kong was a British colony. So particularly speaking, I've never lived in China because I left, I left Hong Kong before it got returned to China. But in any case, when I was in Hong Kong, everything was celebrated, you know, Princess Diane and Prince Charles wedding and Queen Elizabeth's birthday. Every night we saw, you know, the, the crowning procession at night, you know, it was just, I just still remember all of this, when you just, and then you go to the post office, you saw Queen Elizabeth the third, the her picture. And I was like, you know, we, we just got this idea that everything white is better. And, and that was, that was intentional. It's also that with like, you know, 6 million people, we only got two universities. So we were actually trained as manager to manage our own people, but the rest are labor. We're just labor force. We, we generate revenue for the you know, British empire. And, but then also, of course the bubble burst. Later I found out that Hong Kong was ceded to uh, the England because China lost the opium war when China didn't want to accept opium as a form of payment instead of silver. So British, the British empire under the rule of Queen Victoria just like instigated a war and then took over Hong Kong, you know? And then subsequently what they did was kind of like what Berlin Conference did to Africa. They just, a bunch of them came in and say, I want this, I want that, you know, open the port so we can do business. They always come in as a business. They didn't come mm. in as the British empire. They came in as like East Indian, you know, company or something like that. Like, you know, just, that, that's the same for Nigeria. That's the same for India. They come in as a company. They didn't come in as like, and the company, they come, the company has its own army. Their army at one point is bigger than the British Empire. So it's ridiculous. But anyway, so we, we all are very, you know, gullible. So we, you know, the, the intention was very, anyway. Um, so then I start studying, I went, I, I start studying uh, history the, about, I joined the um, clubhouse and they have a, a club, a book club called Root, Roots and Book books and most of the books that we read has is about Nigerian history a lot of it is about the Biafra war and I learned about that and I also learned about you know the Yoruba culture um, at one point I was engaged to a Tanzanian and then later on um, you know I, I didn't really I didn't understand the culture very well I didn't really understand um, polygamy in, in Africa so I was not really prepared for that. Anyway, so kind of, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it took me a while to learn about all this custom, right, tradition, culture, and I, I have to at some point ask myself, okay, so do I, you know, do I sign on to this or do I step out? Because like, when I first find out, it was it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough to deal with. But then I, I decided I made a decision to be part of, you know, part of it. So so part of this. Part wow. of, Africa and Africans so I just like okay so um yeah so so then I actually after my not so successful really engagement with uh, a Tanzanian I became I became involved with a Yoruba and now my fiance is a Yibo so really? yeah wow <laughs> yeah so then my journey is you know, I, I was talking to one of my friends, he's a movie producer, he's a CEO of Inside Hollywood. And, and we were talking about maybe one day I'll make a movie, we'll make a movie about like, you know, um, my journey to love or something like that. Okay. But, but, okay. but then I can tie into all of these things that happened, you know, from beginning to uh, now, you know, okay. in search of love and see, you know, and then just kind of like, also really discuss what happened, mm. you know? mm. but um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I know that I, uh, when mm. I said, sure. see, listening to you, it's, um, I like to know people. Okay. I, and knowing people's motivation in life makes a big deal. Okay. It tells you why they do the things they do. Okay. Now, uh, if I 
I like I like I love science. Okay, uh, even more I love history. Uh, my father studied history. My father used to teach history. My uncle used to teach history. Okay, so I see be, the the shelf behind me. This place, this line. Are all history. I have there, I have a shelf there, history. Okay. So I love history. Uh, yes, in the last uh, 500 years, Africa has uh, suffered. Yes. Okay. But knowing history, Africa has suffered the same kind of things that all the regions of the world have gone through. That's the truth. Although many people do not know this, and many young Africans are angry, I don't blame them, okay? But for me, I look beyond those the things you call injustice yes in this era based on what is going on we say injustice we, we talk about those things all, all the time but looking back at what different people have gone through colonialism of the of europeans of africa happened but also the countries that that colonized Africa were also colonized in their time. In fact, England was colonized for over 400 years by Rome. That's true. Uh, uh, Southern Spain was colonized by the Moors for over 700 years. So those things happen, happen in, 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 in history. So for me, for me as an in individual, I, I don't hang my heart on talking about injustice. I don't personally, okay. Many young Africans do, many older older Africans do, but I don't. I I I prefer to say what are the facts, and the facts in history doesn't lead me to believe that Africans were specially selected to be man, margina, man, marginalized. That's the, for me, that is the fact of history because it has happened to other people. And I, I look, I want to see, I'm in this space talking about all those things and having this podcast because I want young Africans to say, okay, we have gone through this. That is rough, that is bad, but what can we pick to help us move forward? Because if we continue talking about injustice, 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 we will not move forward. And that's what I don't, I don't want for my homeland. I want us to move forward. Anyway, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. In particularly, hey, uh, you are engaged to my homeboy, okay? I'm Igbo, okay? So let's go. Uh, maybe you invite me to your, to your wedding eh? I, and I will come to, where, where, is it, where is it from in Nigeria? In, in, is it Imo, Anambra, uh, where? Or even Delta? He, his his hometown is Egusu. Am I oh, correct? No, Enugu. Enugu. I'm sorry. Yes, I, yes. I, I, I put it as 
Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been trying his defense to tell me that okay, this is my favorite <laughs> recipe and work on it. And I was like, okay. Mm. <laughs> Enugu, you're right. Enugu, Enugu yes, yes. Right, See, right, right now he lives in Annabelle. Okay. See, Enugu, I have family in Enugu. I've only been there once when I was one year old. My grandmother took me. And the second time in 2002 for a, a friend's wedding. So that's the, time, the only times I've ever been in, in Enugu. But I have, I have families. Family they have been living there all their lives. My cousins. All right? So, Elaine, now you have told me your journey through Africa diaspora, okay? So let, let's talk about, like I, like I said, I, I see you involved in so many African uh, organizations and working towards uh, what we want, we want to develop, okay? So you, you, can you tell me uh, about the African Youth Diaspora Organization and uh, uh, the state of Africa diaspora? Can you tell, tell me more about this organization and your involvement with them? Yeah. Um... Well, okay, let's go to African Diaspora mm. Youth Diaspora Organization first, AYDO. Uh, I was invited by one of the ambassadors from the state okay. of African Diaspora to stop that. Um, he sees my passion, he saw my passion toward yeah. Africa, and he invited me to be the co-founder. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, later on, we didn't really, didn't pay, I, he happened to be an evil as well. Ah, okay. <laughs> All of my partners, the like business partners, and uh, there was something about our intellectual resonance, like, it just clicked really well together. Yeah. But in any case, um, so he invited me to start. And one day, um, I was kind of like on the fence. I was like, are you sure? You know, I'm not of African blood. I'm not sure how people would feel about that. You know, <laughs> like, go ahead, go ahead. And like, he, he just really believed in me. And I was like, okay. And then, but I was still kind of like startling a little bit. And then one day on Martin Luther King Day, I was mm. in a Buddhist, like, not a Buddhist temple, but a gathering in, in Hawaii. Okay. Uh, in the US, I, I, I spent, I, I mean, initially lived in Hawaii. Okay. And when I was um, in that temple, um, there was like people from all over the place and they were talking about, uh, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, and his, um, his uh, dream and vision, you know. And then when I was sitting there, we were talking, and I was telling my story of how I was whitewashed in terms Ooh. of my thinking when I was growing up. And then I just suddenly that day, I was like, okay, this today is the day I'm gonna form AYDO, the African Youth Diaspora Organization on January 20th, 2020 on Martin Luther really? King. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, I register, I get the EIN, you know, the federal, uh, you know, ID number. And then that's it. I was, we started that. And then, uh, and then it's just slowly built on it. I, the first, crop of members uh, directly from the model United Nations um, ambassadors that I recruited. Um, a lot of them are Nigerians. Okay. And of course some are South African and Zimbabweans. And we have people from Uganda and as well as uh, a few from Tanzania, um, Ghana. Okay. A few from Ghana. So then that kind of make up our majority of our initial founding members. Okay. Um, do, do you guys have a do you have guys have a chapter in the UK, for example? That, that's we have a chapter. No, uh, our our headquarters in the our our global headquarters is in the US, and then yeah. our African headquarters is in Ghana. Okay, so you guys don't have a, a chapter in in Europe. We are starting, we don't, we're not going to have a chapter in Europe, but what we're going to do, yeah, one of the initiatives that we do is called the Integrative Center for Africans and Diaspora. And we have chapters uh, of uh, ICAP um, okay. in uh, US as well as um, uh, Tanzania. And then that is where we're going to put in with the chapter we're going to put in Europe. Um, okay. Because it, it's really a solution center because what happened was we saw the need for solutions like repatriates uh, who come to Africa or vice versa. They need to have, to have a, a network, a safety net, a network mm. of support. When they come, for example, if you're African diaspora and then 
you come to the um to Africa, you need services such as like how do you get a visa? How where do you buy a house? How do you get a car? You know how do you even something as simple as like get transportation, like you know or um registering a business, uh you know so on and so forth. Mm. So uh, we need solutions because you know Africa is. There's a lot of gray area in Africa, and just like the early China, uh, in terms of when they, when they, you know, during this past forty years of time, China has been been one of the lowest GDP country to one of the highest G- GDP country, and the same I see that is happening to Africa, but Africa is a lot more complex because of course Africa has fifty yeah. seventy five countries, and China has one country, and then you have somebody who is like basically on the top and then say you know this is how that's going to be done see but africa, a, a, apart from apart from okay. the from the number of yeah. countries right yes mm-hmm. africa has over three thousand tribes yes see yes. Th- this is something that people outside africa don't understand the the number of tribes in africa and africa has over 2000 languages right see now that's one thing though you didn't that, that that we cannot miss yes i understand that but at the same time africa in a way is very ubuntu meaning that it's just like the culturally speaking yes there's 2000 something tribes and 2000 something languages and 55 countries but africa i have never into a continent where people recognize they didn't say oh i'm canadian nobody ever said i'm north american no you just never nobody's gonna say i'm south american or nobody's gonna say i'm asian they're gonna say i'm indian i'm malaysian i'm Vietnamese, right Mm -hmm. but africa they uh, so many times they were the first thing they would say i'm an african yeah when we are outside africa we say that Okay, but when I when I'm in Africa, I'm yeah, Nigerian. Yeah, well, well, okay. But okay. look, I'm when I'm outside, I'm walking around Chinatown. Nobody's gonna tell me that I'm Asian. They're gonna say I'm Chinese, right? Yeah. African is different. African, they would say they would say I'm an African. Like if I run into somebody's like, the first thing they're gonna differentiate is like, oh, um, I'm Ghanaian. Like they would say I'm. I'm trying to say is like instead of calling themselves black, I'm black, like you know, because black is kind of African diaspora. I am African, yeah. you know. We, yeah, we, we, it's say for 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 me, it was deliberate to identify myself as African. Okay. So why why didn't you say first like I'm Igbo? What why why wouldn't you say I'm okay Igbo? okay good I I will answer that. See, I was born in Delta State, then Bendel State in Southern Nigeria, okay? Uh At the age of five, I and my family moved to the Western side of of the country. And I will tell you, I've lived all my life, before I came to the uh, the UK, I lived almost 30 years of my life in Lagos. So you live in the Yoruba land? Yes. Mostly. I see, I speak, I well, I used to. I used mm-hmm. to speak Yoruba and Igbo fluently. In fact, I could read Yoruba. I, I have never been, I have never read Igbo. Wow. And Delta State, Delta State is not exactly Igbo though, right? I mean, no, it's... No, no, I see, I'm Igbo. Okay, all right. Because okay. I, I know that there's... Even though I, I, I'm from Delta State, but some of us in Delta State are Igbos. Right, right. I know. Okay. I, I'm, I, I, I'm I was Igbo. surprised to find out, like, there was this little differentiation. But no, yeah. understood. Yeah. So, understood. So I, I speak to you about most of my friends, most, maybe up to 80% of my friends, are Yorubas to today. Many of them are Muslims. Right. So for me, I have never been the kind of person to say, 
to tout my ethnic et ethnicity. Never. Oh, you see, because I'm, you, I'm, 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 I'm more, uh -huh. more negotiable than anything else. You're, you're more what? Negotiable. Negotiable. Negotian. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Even though I was born in Delta State, but I'm more Lagosian. I see. I know Lagos and Western Nigeria than any other place in Nigeria. I understand that because even for myself, I actually identify with Taiwan more than I identify with Hong Kong. Okay. So I understand where that come from. Yeah. Because like in people just think Chinese are all the same, but that we're not. Like we're there are obviously Chinese, there are people from Taiwan, there are people from Hong Kong, there's people from mainland China. You know, all these things that all these like targets, media targeted the media agenda from the US, they are really targeting, you know, China, Chinese China. But they're not, you know, it's like when you talk about places like Taiwan, where most of the immigrants from China, uh, you know, in the 40s, they were fighting against the communist China. So that in, in centrally, you know, in even Hong Kong Chinese today, they're still fighting against the, you know, um, what the, the, the construct. So, so I think there's, uh, you know, differences, but anyway, mm. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to divert. I, yeah. Go on. <laughs> so See, you know, my, my, my background, people were like, China, Chinese is like, uh, you know, it's just like saying that, oh, you're all African. So, you know, South Africans is the same as like Nigerian, same as like Tanzania. It's not. It's totally different. Exactly. You know, this Bantu, Bantu culture is very, you know, very e even now, the 11. Now, I, yeah. hear, I hear this thing about Bantu culture. Bantu yeah. culture, you, I, when I was in Nigeria, I had never heard about that. I, I only started hearing about it when I came to the West. So, so, so when people say Africa is Bantu, I just got them, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm, I'm from the, the biggest country in Africa. And in my, in my country, we don't talk about it. So how can you tell me that is African culture? See, in truth, in truth, there is no one African culture. There are, there are multiple different cultures in Africa. You see, I, I want Africans to collaborate, okay, to mingle, to do things together. But for us to do that, first, we need to understand our differences because there are many, many, many differences. And until I, I understand the difference with my, my brother or my sister, I can't, we can't work together. Now, though I, you know, you said that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I can't help it. I need to ask you a question yes. then. By denying that, uh, that the, 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 the suffering of the, the past, it, I think it's important to recognize that. I know that you want you want Africans to move on, the youth, yes. the African youth to move on from yes. the past. But mm. the thing is, that's one thing that I, I noticed the difference between Africans and African diaspora. African diaspora are very keenly aware of their political reality. Mm. I, and, to, and, and you guys think we are not aware? No, no, no. I'm talking about they want, they want, they want to emphasize um, the fact that 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 the past reality is not in the past. They are still why why West not? I'm gonna give you an example. Okay. Okay. So I was divorced in 2018. Okay. And then after my divorce, my first um, boyfriend was from Alabama. And he, uh, you know, his, his family is a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, um, a, a very big, you know, Black family. And I remember... Before I met him, I didn't date anybody, you know, like 
that was um, of African descent. So I have to, you know, be honest. I felt like all this racial injustice at the time because I was not in the mix. I I had white privilege, right? So I didn't realize that it was actually real. How how I to the extent how real it was until until we travel together and he always get chopped. Okay. Yeah. No matter what, I I can just see him visibly get you know Angry. stressed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and anxious and and okay. and the way they they did it was it, sometimes it's not just not even merciful and mm. I felt like it was so insulting. Yeah. It was so insulting for him to be with me and then has to go through that. And I tell you, yeah, nobody, when we go through the airport together, a lot of time they didn't even know we're together. So I will literally go straight. I just walk through. Mm -hmm. I never get stopped. Yeah. And he always gets stopped. Okay. And he always gets, no matter how many times he takes things out of the pocket and things like that. And when we go to the store, he will get followed, but I won't. Mm. And that's what I knew that the social injustice, the systemic racism still exists to this day. And that was when I really opened, it really opened my eyes and say, I, I just, I thought it was in the past, but it's not. And okay. then when you, said, when you said, oh, this is just something that we're, we're dwelling in the past, something like that. And I can tell you one thing. Now I told you that I was very brainwashed, right? When I was growing up in the colonial culture. So, you know, being brainwashed, we learn to put white in the pedestal. We learn English. A, a, a lot of people do that in Africa. Exactly. So I was like, I was like that, right? And so I married somebody who's white. Okay. And one time when I first got married, I said, um, why is there racism toward blacks? You know, you know, and he's like, because of fear. And I didn't understand that. Mm. I was like, huh? I don't understand. What do you mean by fear? Like, it just feel like there was a lot of, um, in terms of, for example, income, you know, or, 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 or things like that. It's like, I, what are you fearful of? And I didn't yeah. realize that until I really understand the Black culture or the African culture. Mm. Then I realized, oh my God. You know, it's like, I always tell people, even even the Nigerian youth, I told him, I was like, you know, you are African descent, you are a superior race, you are intellectually outstanding, you are physically supreme, you are emotionally empathetic, and most important, most importantly, you're spiritually integrated. So your 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 head and your heart and your body and your spirits are in tune. And that's why you are the most empathetic species and you are the supreme species okay. and until the world the thing is white knows that the whites know that and that's why they're so afraid well okay so i'm telling I, you that I, I, you I, I i don't know anything about that okay I no i you. know because okay. I know. Okay. You're, you're, maybe, maybe you, you do. Know because you're, you're african descent but i know I may, may, to maybe you that. do but i, I don't know anything about that and okay. I don't believe anything about that. Okay? That's, okay. that's for me. Okay? Now. now. But that's yes. the value of having somebody like me because I'm neither, you know, black and I'm not white. Well, I'm, say, you know, I die hold, hold on, I, hold on. I, 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 right? Yeah, hold I'm on. tagged with different cultures, right? Then okay. I'm letting you know that. So this is what I saw. But of course, you know, okay. just, just. Yeah, see? Uh, yes, like you, like you mentioned, uh, people suffer some uh, discrimination. Okay, happens. Uh, okay. I'm in the UK. The number one reason why I left Nigeria for the UK was because of police intimidation and violence. Yeah, for me, okay? I have been arrested, taken to the police station at least 10 times in my life. 
I have never committed any crime, not one. But I have been harassed on the road more than 30 times. And I've been arrested to the police station at least 10 times. Now, when, they, when I encounter these police people that they want something from me, I don't give them. I have all my papers on point. And when I give them my papers, do you know, do you know what they do? They walk away. And then we start arguing, arguing, arguing. I spent hours on this. That was, that was in my own country, Nigeria. And what, what kind of paper are you talking about? You're talking about NSAS, right? No, no, like, no, no. no. So see, I'm, see, I'm, 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 I'm older than it. See, I'm telling you, when NSAS happened, uh -huh. I cried. I cried because these young people are fighting the wars I should have fought. Mm. Okay, I mm -hmm. tried to fight it, but because I had the means, I fought a little bit and I decided, no, I can't do this again anymore. That's because I had children. Okay, and I've said, I, I can't be doing this because I've been threatened being shot several times. Okay, and I said, I don't want to be killed one day and my kids will suffer. And that's why, because I had the means, I decided to leave the country. Now, why am I telling you this? Even in a country of black people, People, young people were dis discriminated. Young people who drive, young people who have laptops. You see, what I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that they are always discrimination of some kind in society. Now, am I saying what happens to African Americans is okay. I'm not saying that. Okay. But I'm just highlighting the fact that it happened even in a country that is predominantly black. Okay. Now, having said that, even in America, okay, where like you said, there is a white supremacy, okay? A lot of young African-Americans use white supremacy as a reason why they haven't progressed. Uh, I used to, I used to, I used to be on their side. I used to, I'm telling you. But I will tell you, I'm not in that on that bandwagon anymore. I'm telling you, because that apart from the the violence I've seen, okay, when something happens, well, I've also dug into the data. Okay, yes, there's discrimination but uh, I'm sure many few African Americans that listen to my podcast will not like this but I'm tell you this the police in America doesn't kill black people more than any other group now Police violence, police violence is real. Okay, police violence is real. Like I just told you, in my own country, that's why I came. I, I ran away. So police violence is real, but in America, they don't specially target black people. 
to kill them. Where do you get your statistics from? Okay. Now they say they say if our, right. hold on, hold on, hold on. They uh -huh. say they say Harvard professor called Roland Fryer. Okay, check him out. There's he, overwhelming. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Stats. I mean, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. He, he did the work, and you know, you know what, you know what, he's a black man. He did the work, and when he finished the work, he was told not to publish it. He did the work. Now, in his work, the conclusion is that, yes, when it comes to harassment, yes, there is a statistical, static, uh, whatever, that Blacks are more harassed than, than other people, yes. But when it comes to killing, no. How about incarceration, jailing? Well, I, 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 I haven't done that uh, level of work, but but there's so many things. But so I many, have done that. Okay, there, there's so many yeah, things. Hold on. Population in black yeah, and, yes, and there's so many things. Jail. What? Uh, African Americans about twelve to thirteen percent in the U.S. You know, uh, but uh, in terms of incarceration, they are about uh, forty percent. Okay. It's also it, it's disproportional. Okay. Now, wh when it comes to the crime, what's the this, the crime stats? And that's why we said systemic racism, right? And you mm, said... No, no, oh, hold on. Let's leave uh, uh, racism. No, we can do that. This is part of the political system. And I'm telling you that the difference between what you're saying and what I'm saying is mm. you can change the political system so there's no more SARS, but you can't change the color of the skin. You cannot go around in the shopping center or okay. go to... Uh, I, I was I was I was coming to that. I was coming to that. Now right. Africans, Caribbeans, Nigerians. See, I have a lot of family in America. All right? Okay. They have been black from Africa. They haven't changed the color of their skin. Okay. Neither neither did the children they had in America have white skin, right? Do, okay. do, you understand, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. They are not complaining or being targeted for that black skin. They are success. See, all my family, that, see, when I say I have a lot of family, I have a lot of family. In fact, my, my first daughter was born in America, okay? I have a lot of family okay. in America, okay? Mm -hmm. None of them have been specifically focused, followed, harassed more than normal. They are all successful. So you're saying that because they're more successful? And no, no, no I, I'm, see, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying okay. that, okay? But I'm saying this, I'm saying this, Specifically, their skin is as black as it was when they were in Africa. They haven't changed it. So uh, I leave it to for you to tell me why not. I felt like there was a political consciousness or awareness that we are we differ. Okay. So. I I actually don't really want to go into it because I don't think that's going to make any difference. Whatever no. I said, no, I can. I, I, I can only tell you. I can only tell you from. I most of your guests are probably. I don't think that many of guests have that kind of cultural experience that I have. You know, okay. and then and so when I'm talking about these race issues, I'm not talking. I'm not coming from an angle of as a, a, a African descent. I'm not coming from an angle as a white. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty neutral. I, I want to say I'm pretty neutral. No, you're, you're, also, you're, not, you're not neutral. I also know a lot of different, different. Um, you know, I've interacted with different cultures. Okay. Right? I have, like, I have too. 
uh, Indian, you know, um, European. Yeah, right. I, I have two. Uh, Mediterranean, Middle okay. Eastern. I have two. See, you know what? You know what? The doctor mm -hmm. that de delivered me and my sisters are not black. But you are African descent. You actually see, live in I'm, that. I'm, see, I'm African. I'm Nigerian. I'm Igbo. Understand okay. that. So you are you are in a bubble. I'm not. In what a do bubble. you mean? What do you mean? I'm in a, in a bubble. You are you are in the receiving end of things. Receiving receiving end of what? Of being of experiencing uh, African descent reality, but I'm not. He hello, hello. Yes. I lived I lived the most of my life in Africa. I love what? Africa. Okay. That's what I said. Okay. I just hold on, hold on. I'm yeah. here in UK. Yes. I'm living my life. See, I, I, I don't think we want to focus on this divisive and arguments. See, you do a lot of important, important things in Africa. So that's what I want us to talk about. But that's important. That's what we talk about at the state of African diaspora. We talk about, we talk, we 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 remind each other. Okay. How important it is to understand the present reality. Okay. Of so, continual. So I, I, I just give you, I, I'm just giving you my own reality and the reality of many of my family members who live in North America. Okay. Okay. So they don't have the same reality that people who talk about white supremacy, uh, white privilege. They don't. I I don't. I mean, of course, we all have our why, very why not? experience, right? Okay. We why, all have why some not? Very, very personal experience. Like I I like to just count on statistics. The average income of African American in the U.S. is about forty thousand, and then for white is sixty thousand, for Asian is eighty thousand. That is the reality. The reality okay. is about uh, tell, the tell me, tell me, what what month. is the average of for Nigerians? I don't know what the average for okay. Nigerians. See, but I, 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 tell, I, I, I don't know the average, but I know the average of Nigerians is higher than the average white American. Why, 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 why is that? No, I see what, why is that? Uh, because Nigerians are highly educated. They are the, actually the most uh, educated ethnic groups in the exactly, US. Exactly, exactly. So the point is this. If people who crossed the sea in the last few decades to come to America, they came there, they did their thing, and they are some of the most successful people in America. See, tell, tell me, Helen, do you think as if a, a, an African in Nigeria, do you think if I was in San Francisco, I step out of my, my house, that people will know this guy is not African American is African. Do you do you think they, they will know that? See me stepping out of my house. Uh, I'm not sure what you're trying to get at. But, what, um, what, what I'm what I'm trying to get what I'm trying to get to is this: mm -hmm. Africans, okay, and African Americans, they look alike. Nobody knows knows the difference yeah, until like, oh, on, oh, until no. you speak to them. Right. Okay. Right. So, what is the difference between them that allows one group to become successful, not complaining so much about white supremacy, about this, about that, about that, and the other group complaining about that? You know, education has will always bring. Well, well, I should say, uh, people who are educated has more opportunity to make okay. better income. That's always true across that, the board. That's Whether good. That's know, that's good. It doesn't matter what race you are, right? Okay. I tell you this, Obama, when he first the day he won the first election in his book, he said, "I went to the airport, airport, and I got searched." Yeah. 
and he's Obama. Okay. My point is that race. No, no, hold on, like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes. Was it that that story he was searched? Was that after he became president or before? He won his first election as the senator. As a senator, okay. Yeah, okay. So he was at the airport because he's okay. done thing that day. He got, you know, he was with his crew and he got stopped. Okay. Compared to his other colleague. Okay. You know, the camping office. And then the thing is that it, it, I'm I'm not saying that. Okay. See, is- I, I've 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 come to um, America several times. Okay, I passed airport in Florida, airport in Los Angeles, airport in Philadelphia, airport in uh, Dallas, airport in Houston. I have never experienced anything abnormal. That's me. And I'm, I'm black. I'm, my, my color never changed. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen to any people, I'm, but I'm just saying, hey, I've never experienced that anywhere for me. Okay. Okay. So my, 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 my point is this. See, I know that there is racism. Okay. I know that there is discrimination in life. Okay, but what what I'm just saying to you is this. Those things happen. But people still do what they need to do. do. Okay. And uh, that's what I encourage young Africans to do. No matter what happens, unfair, whatever, focus on your goal. Focus on where you go, where you want to go. Because I will tell you this: once you buy into the victimhood mentality, you are done. I don't disagree with that. I think we're on the same page. Once you buy into a victim Mm -hmm. mentality, you are done. I think taking accountability is very important. And that's what I stress too, uh, when I'm talking about, even when you talk about Chinese, you know, debt trap issues, yes. things like that. And uh, later on, we're gonna go into that, but um, I do believe that taking accountability, no matter what, is very important. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's see, this is, this is a big part of, the things we need to work out, okay? Because I would I would tell you, uh, I've uh, realized for some years now that a lot of young Africans go on social media and all they talk about is uh, this unfair, that is unfair, that is unfair. When they talk about unfair in every space, they won't have time to talk about what we need to do to develop a continent. I don't disagree with that. I've seen a lot of that happen even among the traditional rulers in the state. And I did realize that and come to the conclusion that it's really important to focus on solutions. And that's what I have been doing, at least in my own, yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah. But the thing is, it doesn't stop me, stop us from discussing history. No, and, of course. But yeah. see, when it comes to history, again, I will tell you, history, uh, hey, I love history. I really, really love history. See, you know why I love history? Because it allows me to see the difficulties that our, our, our ancestors went through. And it tells me, man, these guys, have gone through all these difficulties and yet they did what they needed they needed to do to deliver me and you here. 
That means I must do everything in my power to deliver the next generation. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Yeah. We're right here. Someone had to do the work to, to put me and you here. So it's our responsibility to go through the difficulties around us and yet deliver the next generation in the race. Okay. Yeah. You know, so that's, uh, that's something very important for me, you know. So, uh, Elaine. Yes. Now. Just so you know, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I need to remind you because I, I allotted about one hour for this interview Ooh. and I have to start working in about 15 minutes. Oh. So I, I was wondering Ooh. if you continue this. Ooh. There's a whole lot more questions, right? I, yeah. I love that. You see? Yeah. see, that's why I told you, let's move on from that topic because that topic is big. See, it's yes. big. Okay, let, let, let's, let's go through some few things. Uh, I, I see what is transdisciplinary agro for, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to pr pronounce it. The C-A-F-F-D-S. What is it? So my friend Osinakachi, um, he's in Alaivo and he started, he founded this organization um, okay. focused on transhumanism, futurism, as well as nowadays, uh, this year the theme is Afro longevity. Mm, and stuff. Mm. So the full name of he's a philosopher, and he okay. he and philosopher friend started this group, and I got involved as a uh, a speaker. But then later on, I get to know Osinagachi really well. Um, see, the thing is, we're talking about we keep looking back, we're not looking forward, and that's what I spent two years mingling with the traditional rulers, mingling with the state of African diaspora, mingling with the African youth. And what I realized is every single circle I was in, we were talking about how we have suffered. Okay. And I was like, you know, I know, I know the past, I know the present, you know, more or less compared to when I first started, but I don't see the future. And okay. I was like, I really want to, I was like, I'm stuck. I feel stuck. I feel like I don't know how to move. Then when I met Osinakachi, he is actually the award-winning theorism philosopher. He's the yeah. only one, I believe, in the continent. And then that's when I was like, why do you study fear? And then I realized I was like trying to unravel the distrust among Africans with each other. I'm trying to understand what is that, why, why is African underdeveloped? And then I realized that a lot of it has something to do with this, you know, fear. It's almost like a PTSD that many Africans and African diasporas are experiencing. So by studying, I, I felt like when I was with, when, when I started with TAFFDS, it gave me a way out because I was not actually really analyze, you know, um, fear, the roots of fear, and then with his other part, you know, partner like Ugo Chuku, who studies about basically self awareness and self development, and that's where you, everything kind of come together. I see a way out. I see a future, mm. and, and that's why I started to, you know, volunteer my time with TFFDS, which stands for Transdisciplinary Agaro. Okay, you know, for future discussions. So a lot of topics that we talk about, it's like at first it was 4 IR, 4, fourth industrial revolution, and then transhumanism and singularity, and then futurism and now Afro yeah. longevity. You know, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So you guys are going to have a summit yeah. later. In yeah, in August. Yes. Mm. Wow. Well, we're, this is our second summit, but this time is we're bringing longevity movement. Yeah. Um, in the world to Africa, and it's very meaningful to me personally. Yeah, because um, we were looking for a venue for this longevity um theme, and it just happened that last year we um the we had the first basically summit in near Johannesburg, 
and we visited the cradle of humankind. Yeah. And I was, I was telling Usnakachi and Brenda, which is the CEO, I was like, wouldn't it be like perfect to have our uh, event at the hu- cradle of humankind? Because we all came from, you know, Africans, our yeah. first mother and we, father. See, we we're all, all are Africans. Africans. Yeah, we're all Africans. And we yeah. can talk about Afro long, like, and Africa has the most diverse genes. And that's why I said Africans are the strongest species. And, and, and <laughs> I was like, why don't we just bring home that? We bring everybody home. Because this event, we're going to have the world longevity is a huge money. Yeah, <laughs> money is yeah it is. Because everybody, people like uh, founders of Amazon, Google, they all want, they, they're all into this, right? Yeah. They're all into longevity. See, they're, 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 all, they're all scared to die. Right. So they want to, <laughs> exactly. And they, they have a good life. They want to, and there's a lot of money involved. So we are bringing it to Africa. I was like, mm. why can't Africans be part of this longevity movement? See, uh, I, I will tell you this. Uh, my, my ancestors, three, three generations before, died young. No, four generations before upward, died young, most of them before the age of uh, 50, okay? Mm -hmm. But my, one of my great grandfathers, I I saw him, he died close to, it was, it was 98. He died in 1983, okay? My grandfather, my mother's father, died at 96 in 1998. My grandmother died at 94 in 19, no, 2000, uh, 2010. Okay. So you have, you have very good genes. Yes, yes, we, we do. But I will tell you this. My mother, my mother died eight years ago at 65. Mm. Okay, so what I'm saying is this: somehow, for some reason, uh, member members of my family have gone through from dying at younger ages to dying at very uh, substantial age, and then now my mom has gone back a little bit. Although my mom's, my mom's brother is uh, 82 now. He's still, he's still alive. So somehow maybe I'll be lucky enough to live to, to, to my 80s. Hey. <laughs> oh, I, just, I can just tell that you're going to live long. <laughs> okay. I, I hope so. I hope so. You will. So, so let, let, let's take one, one more, one more, one more uh, topic. Uh, what, what's your view about Africa, US, Africa, Russia, Africa, China, Africa, EU, Africa summits? See, they, they call Africa uh, presidents to come for summits now the African leaders have decided, hey, we will not be, be called like little boys and girls to come and, and, and sit down and be lectured by, by the, the, the so-called big boys, you know? Okay, what, so what, 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 what do you think about, about those summits? Well, first of all, 70% of a, a, a African Union's budget come from Europe. That is mm. in 70, over 70% of a African Union's budget, annual budget come from Europe. So yeah. that's a little bit of a handicap there. Yeah. But simply put, I think African sovereignty must be respected and Africa, Africans sh- should always choose Africa first, regardless whether it's US, China, Russia, it doesn't matter. The, Africans and Africa, African nations should not be forced to choose side. I'm, I'm sure most audience agree with me on that principle. Yeah. However, in reality, is that as long as we're financially reliant on the other countries, 
um, it's difficult, but you have a whole world social construct against you, the financial institution, the credit rating, the IMF, the World Bank, you know, the uh, even OECD, even United Nations, it is a Western construct, including military bases from the NATO and the Africa. They're all over Africa. It, it is difficult. And, and the thing is, you, we are still, there's still a lot of money that's being siphoned out of uh, Francophone countries to France, for example. Until those issues are addressed, we are at the mercy um, of you know, the hunters. And mm. so but that can be changed. Self-reliance, you know, there's a lot. People ask me, I just simply state that systematically, the solution is systematically implements organized knowledge. You know, if it's, the resources is already here, we just need to organize it. African diaspora has the responsibility to tra knowledge transfer to, to help to build systems within the African continents, just like what China did, that the Chinese diaspora did for China. It's the same thing. And, and I, know, I, I, I know we're running out of time and I wanted to say that um, yeah. uh, there's a, actually studies uh, from uh, Oxford yeah. And saying, you know, it, it lays out that um, Africa actually borrow far more money from uh, Europe, like uh, through IMF and World Bank than China. China only constitutes about like 10, 15 percent mm. of uh, all the loan that uh, Africa borrowed. Yeah. And China's loans is at a much lower interest rate than the IMF and World Bank. And that is a publication by Oxford. You can Google it. Yeah. So Chinese debt trap. Every time everybody I talk to, that is like scholar scholars in this area saying that is not true. So mm. I wanted to put that out. And mm. you know, it's the same thing that's working against Africa in terms of media's agenda. That is why we have Lens of Africa ourselves because we want to reinterpret and rebrand Africa the way it's supposed to be, the authentic Africa and Africans that's supposed to be understood by the world and not whatever is being circulated, you know, okay. single story perspective. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, 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 get, I get what you're saying. I, and I, I agree most, most of them. See, like I said earlier before, see Africans, we have the opportunity to rebrand our continent. Yes, okay. we have the opportunities to rebrand re re our continent. See, again, I, I will go back to history. Whatever the big in quotes, big boys, America, Europe, China, Russia is doing to Africa, those kind of things have been done by the so-called big boys of the past to the little boys. Of that of the of the past, but there there is always a way for these so-called small people to become big. Okay, so see that that's why I don't buy into that victim mentality. Okay, I rather buy into the the uh, uh, opportunity and visionary hope story by looking back and say what did these guys do when they faced this kind of problem and, then, and i can summarize that in one sentence for you okay. this is a message i can i have for african youth as well whether your youth as long as you're african or african descent especially for african i i i whatever you do whenever you're going to a space of negotiation when you have to um you know, speak at the table. You must always come from the position of strength. I agree. You must always do that when it comes Good. to negotiating, whether it's Russian, whether it's Americans, and whether it's Europeans, you must come from, because you do have a lot of strength, a lot. They, they, the reason that they are all hammering here is because they have, you have something that they want. Okay. And you need to, understand that is your strength and then when you go on the table you must come from the position okay. of that, that that's true we must come from position of strength but i would say this that's 
will, so that you can go on and do what, what you need to do. See, for me, having the minerals of the world is not strength. See, there are very few countries or regions that have been that have been uh, world powers or whatever based on minerals. Leaders come from knowledge. See, see knowledge, eh? the knowledge that people can can have, the thinking ideas are ten times bigger than any mineral you find in the ground. Because without, without knowledge, the minerals are useless. But knowledge is a resource too. Yes, that's the point. Knowledge as it is the ultimate resource. So that's what I'm trying to promote, knowledge. We can have all the minerals, but if we don't have the knowledge to exploit those minerals, to use them, those min minerals, we will continue being being dominated by right. those so, by so those implementation have... of organized knowledge. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you know, uh, Mister, what's his name now? Hill, Napiro Hill. Yes. So, Ellen, thank you very much for being a great guest of Think Big for Africa. I know we have we have uh, Trump uh, Trump punches, but I I I I hope we will have another opportunity to talk. All right. I hope so too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.